All right. Welcome back, everyone, and thank you for registering for our fourth annual Archive Space Online Forum. I'm Jessica Crouch, the Community Engagement Coordinator for Archive Space. Today's the second day of the forum, and all of today's sessions are community discussions. We hope that you are all ready to participate and offer your insights and tips, and don't hesitate to ask questions. I'm going to go ahead and drop the link to the forum's wiki in the chat. This includes the agenda, some attendee tips, and a post-forum evaluation that I hope you all complete. You can leave and come back during sessions as you wish. Your connection information will remain the same throughout the day. We are recording today's sessions. Recordings will be linked in the event wiki page in the coming days. If you have a general question, need some form of assistance, or just want to chat with your fellow attendees, please feel free to reach out using the chat option at the bottom of your screen. You can also pop in questions and comments relevant, relevant to the discussion there, and I'll read them out loud, but you're encouraged to unmute yourself when the time comes for discussion. You also have the ability to turn on closed captioning at the bottom of your screen. You can elect to show or hide subtitles by selecting live transcript at the bottom of your screen and pressing the little up arrow there. You can also elect to view the full transcript either in tandem with subtitles or in lieu of subtitles by selecting that option there as well. If you need help during the forum, please use the chat box or you can email archivespacehome at lyricist.org. But keep in mind, due to the large number of attendees and the fact we're currently participating in the forum, we may not be able to resolve all of your issues or get to your email, but we'll do our best. And with that, we're going to dive into today's sessions. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen, Valerie, so you can start sharing yours whenever you're ready. Uh, our first discussion of the day will be led by the Metadata Standards subteam, and I think Valerie Adonisio is going to take care of introductions for the team members, so I'm just going to toss it over to Valerie. Hello and good morning again for those on the East Coast. Good morning, everyone. I am Valerie and I am this year's lead for Metadata, the subteam. And I am here to represent and to introduce as well my fellow subteam members. That's Jared Campbell at the University of California, Davis, Elizabeth Roque at Emory University, Kevin Schlotman at the Columbia University, Rare Book and Manuscript Library, and Regina Eberlein at Princeton University. Uh, together we make up this term's metadata team, although some of us have served on the team uh, for more than one term and we have a deeper history of sort of some of the ideas that we'll be sharing with you today. I haven't seen any panicked messages so I'm assuming you can hear me and see my screen. So um, let me tell you a little bit about metadata, uh, who we are. We're actually one of the more recently created um, uh, sub teams on the Technical Advisory Council Committee, Council. Um, so our role is that we support the archive space community by being transparent and proactive when we can to documenting the metadata standards used by the archive space application and monitoring the standards landscape. So here we're talking about EAD, DAX, uh, their relationships with archive space, and those just to name uh, two. Some things that we do is we document which metadata standards archive space adheres to. And this is important and actually quite a lot of what I will be talking about this morning. We maintain the a space data map. So if you've ever wondered where does this field in EAD map to archive space and you've used one of the data ma maps that are provided, those are usually, those were originally created um, years ago, I think in the, the origins of archive space, but that are now maintained by this sub team. We also monitor the archival metadata landscape for changes. Uh, we keep our eyes on JIRA tickets that come in uh, regarded standards, whether or not something is working as expected or a new feature is requested, but it has something to do with metadata and how it maps in archive space. We monitor the listserv for standards related issues and try to help answer questions. And we also advise our other council sub teams on, on matters concerning metadata standards. So on the screen today, you'll see that um, in addition to my introduction, um, I also have a little bit of a note about how you can join us or how you can join any of the councils. Archive Space members are welcome to both the um, User Advisory Council and the Technical Advisory Council. And you do not have to be an Archive Space member to join the TAC Council, the Technical Advisory Council, which means you do not have to be an Archive Space member to be on this team uh, that we are discussing today. So if you have any questions about that, I have the contact information about who you could contact if you're interested in joining the councils. So my first topic this morning, it will be um, a few members of us will each be speaking, but I happen to go first. So I'll continue to speak is that we wanted to share with you the tiers of support. This is what we call um, a project that we've been working on for a little bit as a way of being 
uh, transparent and proactive and sharing with the community of in the standards landscape, there are many different standards. There are standards that are very, very widely adopted. I'll say MARC and EAD 2002 are uh, safe to say widely adopted. There are standards that are nascent or forthcoming, being drafted and worked on as we speak. Um, there are standards that are sort of in an intermediary place right now, maybe EAD 3. Some of you may know that it exists, but you might not be using it. Do you have plans to use it? And so one of the things that we wanted to talk about is, or one of the things that we wanted to do for ourselves was to uh, get a general idea of the clarity on what we thought a tier system would work to say which standards are the best supported, which standards need some work, which standards, um, if two tickets, if five tickets, if 15 tickets come in on the same day, how do we prioritize those tickets? Do we do it based on the content of those tickets or based on which metadata standard those tickets are about and how much support we expect or don't expect to give each of those things? So this is the tiers of support, uh, this web page, and I have put the page um, a few times, I think, into Slack, but I will put it here too if you have a chance to read it. So it's the second link there, the tiers of support. And this is a long document. I don't expect that any of you will have the time to read it right now, but I'll focus right here on the first and second tier. We have who defines these tiers of supports. We, we've done our best to explain why we're doing this. And we do our best to explain what are the differences in our minds between core standards and emerging standards and how we might support those. And I'll give you an example. Um, a best, the best supported standards have both importers and exporters. You can import EAD 2002 into ArchivesSpace and you can export EAD 2002 out of ArchivesSpace. But a lower tier may only give you the ability to export out of archive space. EAD3, you can currently export out, but you cannot import in. So the reason that we brought up these tiers is because we, well, I'll go into, I'll sort of read this with you. So as we began to draft these tiers of supports, we got general approval about the need to be clear about archive spaces relationship with metadata standards, but we received two important and pointed pieces of feedback that we wanted to share with you for, for discussion. The first is that we are conflating supporting a standard in that one can follow a data model in AS and export compliant records with serializing data in a valid record in a particular namespace. So for example, you can say that you support DAX, but you don't export DAX, you export EAD that is compliant with DAX. And so we were conflating in, this, in these tiers of support, sort of the difference between compliance and data exchange. Do you care that you can record DAX compliant records in archive space, or do you care that you can export different types of exchange uh, or you can ex export data for exchange purposes. And our second piece of feedback was our choice of standards was flagged as being very US centric. And we completely agree. The reason for that is, is that we've tended to take a more reactive stance. We look at the standards landscape and the user stories that we hear the most often and that we believe are most widely adopted. And then we tend to prioritize those because there are the most users of a standard. Whereas an emerging standard, and, and RIC might be something here that is a good example of that, doesn't have as much adopted support, but if a space is to be useful to the community outside of the United States, and we believe that it is and should be, we need to be more proactive about those, about those standards. So one of the things we wanted to table for discussion, and so here we are actually getting to the discussion point of it, we hope, is that we would like to ask you in the audience a few questions. And the first one is, I think, a really great one, and it's the one that I'll start with. Why do you use the standards that you use? And this is, question is right here. I think it's missing a word, but that is the question. For compliance reasons or for data exchange reasons? And this is getting to the heart of, I think, what's most important to you? That the fields that you need are in the application or that the fields that you need export out of the application in multiple formats. And all of this comes down to the fact that it's worth underscoring that no system can support all standards at all times, and that the human time and attention available to work on standards is finite. 
So we're looking for some sort of prioritization while we ultimately seek to make that prioritization transparent. So I'd ask, what standards are you currently using? And then the more the kind of the why, are you using them for compliance reasons or for data exchange reasons? And I'll um, mute myself and welcome us to discuss sort of that first point and see where we go uh, from there. And I'd say you're welcome to, depends on you, if you're comfortable, um, you could simply unmute yourself or if you'd like, I will try to get everybody up on the screen and see if I can see any raised hands uh, and call on people. But otherwise I would say there's a lot of people in the room. Uh, so please just unmute and we'll see if we can keep it from getting chaotic. Valerie, there are a few things in the chat and I can read those as those come in. Um, but yeah, please do unmute yourself because um, if everyone chimes in in the chat, it, it does get very chaotic and I uh, can't guarantee I'll see all of your chats. Um, but lots of people are saying for uh, Michael says data exchange and interoperability. Samantha says can't unmute apologies, but data exchange for EAD 2002 for my state based finding aid aggregator. Uh, Carolyn says, we are also focused on interoperability between our systems and with external systems. Jenny says, data exchange so we can share our records outside of our own website. Uh, Natalie says, plus one for data exchange and interoperability. Um, Elizabeth says, DAX, EAD, data exchange. Oh, chats are coming in. Uh, it's very hard. Please unmute yourselves, guys. <laughs> um, data exchange is a priority for us, though we like that Archive Space helps us be compliant. Uh, so Vivian Lee says for compliance, Crystal says for compliance. Um, any thoughts on supporting the rules for archival description RAD as a Canadian, it would be beneficial. Uh, Lexi says, um, I would initially say compliance, increasingly interoperability. Um, Kevin says compliance with DAX, data exchange between systems, mainly the catalog, increasing our digital repository. Kevin and Lexi work at the same institution. Uh, Carolyn says compliance, certainly informs interoperability, uh, data exchange, so I'm not sure this is an either or position. Uh, Nancy says plus one Carolyn's comment. Um, Kevin says both is a valid answer. We're in, oh, we're interoperability first, but DAX compliance too. Eleanor says DAX and EAD, a mix of both. Uh, and then someone else says plus one to Carolyn's comment. So I, I see there's a hand raised at least. So I'm going to go ahead and stop reading the comments and, and ask that people unmute themselves and jump in. And uh, the hand raised is Sarit, so I know she'll jump in. <laughs> Jessica, hi. <laughs> um, yeah, it's easier for me if I just jump in, you know me. Um, I kind of argue it's a little bit of both because um, you'd have a, you'd need compliance in order to exchange the data. And in now, when you're dealing with a lot of exchanging data, you, uh, I think I'm, I'm seeing personally a lot of, um, I'm on the integration team, uh, for those of you who don't know me in TAC, and I'm seeing that many institutions are using um, uh, systems that are created by vendors in many cases, rather than homegrown. And so these systems are often being based on standards. So in order to be able to integrate any systems together, they need to um, adhere to a similar standard or the same standard. So you need to be compliant in those standards in order to, for the data to be exchanged between the two systems. And if the data in one system is not compliant, then it can't exchange properly. So there you go. Excellent. Um, the both, which is sort of what uh, comes out of, of the, um, the uh, to me, based on what I saw scrolling by, it seemed like the answer was either they are about equal, because about the same number of people said compliance as said exports, and then the point made by some, some uh, attendees that these things are essentially, these questions are interrelated and the same, I think points to one of the exact um, <laughs> difficulties we've been having in sort of teasing these two things apart. If, if I uh, just push the conversation a little bit, and then Greg, I see you have your hand up. Um, one of the things that I think has been a sticking point is some of the standards that we're talking about, Mark being one of them, Dublin Core being another, aren't, ex it's one thing to say we want to be DAX and EAD compliant or DAX and ISAT compliant because they're 
intimately tied together. But it's quite another thing to say that we want to be Dublin Core or MARC compliant at the same time as being DOCS compliant. So um, I think that's one of the things that we're trying to tease out is when those standards may not talk to each other as neatly. Greg. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think this is a really great question. Um, so I can speaking for myself, I guess, like, I think I'm a little skeptical of the compliance for compliance sake, and we've gone out of compliance in some locally, um, as long as it didn't uh, limit future like interoperability, as long as there's like a way out. And also like, not all standards compliance is necessarily encourages interoperability. There are like, things in EAD that don't encourage like data centric description that will actually might limit your ability to like migrate out of something. Um, so this is, it, I think it, it's, it, this is a really complicated and really good question, but I think the big picture here, um, and I think why I think it's useful to invest in standards is that it, it allows us to share our resources overall. Like we can build the similar systems and we can like, if we use our own, go in our own direction, we can't, we, as much as we have a finite uh, resources to maintain uh, standards, we also have a, maintain, uh, a finite resources to maintain systems. So it allows us to like share resources in a way that otherwise we would not be able to. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, thank you, Sarit. Uh, let's see, I'm reading some of the chat. Can I jump in and just ask, I've seen a couple of comments about RAD, about ISAT-G, and I'm really curious how many of the folks that are here today use something other than DAX and EAD? We're getting some comments in the chat, so I'll just read them for the recording. Um, going back up, uh, Natalie says, "I'm based in the UK, where ISAG is the compliant is the dominant standard. Our metadata on archive space complies with ISAG. We've created local documentation to help our users see how compliance with ISAG works in practice." Um, that's really cool, Natalie, and I'm probably going to contact you at some point about that documentation. Um, Crystal, who uses RAD, says that they use RAD and uh, commented uh, at Natalie. I like that idea. I will consider that for my Canadian context with RAD. Um, Miriam says we use ISAG G. Um, and then that is it in terms of ISAG G or RAD comments. All right, so thank you so much. And I don't know that I'm gonna have any definitive answers today. This was, um, it helps to see what standards you're using, what, what you're mentioning and the discussion of sort of what we're getting to is the balance of support between supporting a standard and exporting compliant records. And it seems that, let's see, uh, Mark exporter of Denver came to plans, okay. Um, I guess the question is this, what happens if a standard conflicts with another standard? Is there, is there usefulness to, so back to the idea that these are tiers and that we have defined a hierarchy of tier one versus tier two versus tier three. Is that a helpful model for making decisions, for example, when two, two different standards come in conflict with one another, or the idea that in order to make archive space compliant with all standards, the number of fields would inflate and you would end up having on your resource record, you might potentially have, you know, more, is it, does it, does it come down to mapping? We all use only the same five fields in the resource record to kind of reduce it in a, for a discussion point, but they map to 15 different standards. Or do we want all 15 standards worth of dedicated fields in the resource record, creating a resource record that becomes sort of un unyielding or unwieldy? So is it a matter of mapping for export or is a matter of retaining and maintaining and making sure all relevant field 
fields are actually in the application itself. And that's why we care about whether or not you're exporting or not. Because from one field, let's just call it a text field, you could export, you could uh, change the mappings for that export for that one field to comply with any of a number of, of different standards that you are exporting into. But if we're talking about working in archive space, the application itself, do we, what that one field is only going to be one field. And so how would we make it that archive space is both compliant in its, in its own application, in the interface that we use, and as an export tool to all the different standards, where knowing that the exporting is, tends to be easier because we can just have dedicated mappings for every different standard. And I think in the chat, John makes an excellent point. John Reese makes an excellent point that I think it will be impossible to formally state archive space is compliant to any standard, rather that its data model is informed by, oh, and it just jumped on me, informed by a variety of archival and library description, and it supports compliance and interchange with a variety of standards. Um, yeah, Kate? Yeah, the one thing I'd like to point out is that there are some concepts missing from, so we've talked about the Mark 100 field, which is the concept that one creator is, is more important than another. Um, so it's one thing to say, map this field to that field and do some mappings, but when there's an entire concept missing from a system, that's a bit of a problem for mapping. Um, and so the idea of say primary, primary creator um, is an idea that's missing. Well, it's missing from DAX too, I think. I don't know. Right. So it's, yeah, that was... kind of, it's an issue that comes up, but people people didn't recognize it until they started exporting the data to other systems and they ran into this problem, for example. So uh, we learned from our experience in trying to interchange data. So that's a question actually I wanted to ask. So what happens then when we have two standards that sort of conflict with each other? Because when we're talking about DAX and MARC, for instance, in Mark, there is this concept of a main entry, and in DAX, there is not. Um, what? How do we make those decisions of which behavior the application should support? Um, I would actually argue that there is something of a concept in DAX of main entry because you do choose a creator for the title of your collection, and those of us who work in Mark will choose that creator as the 100. Um, occasionally, we have two or three creators that are sort of make it into the title, and we always we have to pick one, and that can be a little difficult. But for the most part, I do a lot of work in Mark that is in, that is the content standard is DAX, but the encoding standard is MARC. That's where most of our archival description is going. Actually, we don't make finding aids for everything. Um, so I don't have a problem with that because DAX does have a concept of picking a creator principally um, in to put in the title. So that usually is pretty easy and safe to, to create a 100 field for. I will say that in terms of standards that are not EAD and DAX, um, this is one of the reasons that I really wanted to put a plug at the very beginning about um, recruitment to this subcommittee. If you use a standard that is not DAX or EAD or is not, frankly, I'll just say an, a US centric or a North American centric standard, then we would love to have you on the metadata committee to help inform these decisions with practical real life um, experience and examples. Uh, it is it, 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 the, the diversity of the group uh, should reflect the diversity of the standards being used. And so I will put um, just this little blob, this join us today um, in the chat as a way of, of letting you know that the nominations um, cycle is actually uh, happening right here right now. The call for nominations for the Technical Advisory Committee will be going out sometime soon, probably in April. And so if this discussion and if sort of the difficulties and the, the challenges that we're uncovering here and the fact that we acknowledge fully that we have a US centric perspective in these tiers as they are currently drafted and that we want to change that, 
please consider nominating yourself uh, to join the Technical Advisory Committee and joining us on the metadata team, uh, because we would really love to hear your voices and to make sure that we understand both the challenges and the windfalls of using other types of standards or not, probably, possibly, um, in archive space and what those frictions are and how we might be able to, um, to change the standards landscape to be more inclusive and more proactive instead of reactive. I have asked Jessica to save the chat and my team and I will probably re-watch re this recording when it is over and we will go through the chat. We will take your feedback um, and we will, uh, we will let you know perhaps next year <laughs> um, if you've helped us inform any of our decisions, but I'd like to move on just in case we don't, so we don't run out of time. Please continue to put things in the chat if you'd like to. Uh, but what I will do again is say, uh, please consider, especially if you have use cases that are not the normal or non-normal, the, the use cases that have so far been represented in archive space that you join us. So I will move on. Uh, just in the interest of time, we can always return to this topic if we have the time at the end. I would like to invite my colleague Elizabeth to let uh, to share her screen. I will stop sharing mine. And she's going to speak to you a bit about what we have done uh, for Mark. Speaking of Mark. Sorry, I lost my mute button for a second there. Um, so I'm going to be speaking. It's great that we're seeing a lot about Mark in the chat because I'm going to speak a little bit about the Mark importer. So I want to be really careful here to say that we're talking about import of Mark records, not export. Export is still on the board. We realize we still need to work on that, but we have done the importer first to talk about getting data from Mark records into archive space. Um, it's been a result of three plus terms of work plus some historical documents um, to get this importer um, mapping into the shape that it is in right now. And that is available with this link, which I should drop into the chat. Um, here is the link to the current proposed um, importer uh, behavior. And I'm going to get rid of that. Um, and as you see, it's got tons of mark tags formatting directions for getting it into archives space and where it will go. Um, one of the things that we wanted to bring um, to this forum today was to do a little bit of talking about how this might be simplified and or streamlined. So one of the problems, those of you who work in MARC know that there are infinite numbers of fields um, and combinations of those fields for people to be able to work with. And that is very, very difficult to support long-term um, simply because there are so many flavors, so many places to put things. And what we were finding is that there were a number of fields, and let me see if I can find it, that just didn't seem to be all that relevant to the work that we do as archivists. So 255, cartographic mathematical data. I suspect that nobody on this call is importing records that need to get that data in. The other thing that we were noticing is most of those um, fields were importing as, and you can see that in the same field here, we're importing as notes with a type of odds. So they're not even importing into necessarily parsable fields or fields that are being used by the archive space application, but rather just kind of noty sort of information. So what we wanted to bring forward um, is to suggest that this could be simplified and we would like to simplify the import behavior. What we have done is mapped everything to DAX. And to do that, we use the DAX standard itself um, to map various fields within DAX to mark fields. And this is available. These are the mappings that are natively published as part of the DAX standard and maintained by um, uh, TSEAS within um, SAA, I believe, are the people who are maintaining that. So if I'm just going to do this for fun and filter and show you the ones that we are proposing to potentially no longer support um, in the importer, 
not talking about the exporter, talking about the importer. Um, so these are all everything that has a no here. So these are all the things that, uh oh, I filtered it wrong. Apologies. We will add that back in. And then we will scroll over. These are all the fields that are potential no's for supporting going forward. So things like dissertation notes, scale note for graphical material, participant or, participant or performer note, lots of notes. Um, local notes, 856 will be, um, we'll talk about that in a sec. But these are the things, and we are looking for feedback from the community of this approach in the sense that we want to simplify it to make sure that um, developers that are working on future requests, we can have a consistent way of dealing with this um, and also for standards compliance. So I will type into chat, raise your hand if you have any thoughts. The other thing that I will mention that is part of this, and I'm going to flip back for one sec, is we are adding um, and I'll get to your question one sec, Kate. Um, we are adding a couple core fields that were left out of the original importer that are core um, to archival description. And those are the 264, 555, 583, 584, and 852. Um, and for Kate's question, can you clarify no longer support? You mean it just wouldn't ingest or it just wouldn't parse? Um, the idea is that those things wouldn't ingest. There are already things in MARC records that won't ingest for you. Um, and Kevin's going to talk about a ticket in a sec that we are proposing um, we would provide when you import. It would tell you what was rejected and what doesn't make it into archive space. That does not mean that institutions couldn't create their own import procedure, but the out of the box archive space importer um, would not support as many fields as it currently does right now because we really feel those aren't being used um, and it's difficult to maintain things that actually don't have use cases for them. So any thoughts or questions? And as always, we are happy to get feedback later. 59X would be one that would be problematic to leave out. We have a tricky catalog and end up using 59X. Yes, um, realize that um, one of the, and would be interested in hearing your thoughts of how those might be handled. Um, and I would ask my colleagues to jump in as well. Um, some of these that we're talking about are also tricky to import because every institution uses 590s in a different way. Um, at Emory, we use them a certain way. I know other institutions use them differently than we do because again, they're local sorts of notes. And so that's really what this importer proposal is designed to address is that fields that have consistent usage and we can rely on that information are gonna consistently be imported. And then other fields that tend to be more local use cases can certainly be imported but won't be part of the core behavior. Could the importer instead do make everything else into a note? Yes, but the thing to remember is that that then has to be written into the code for everything else, which there are 999 fields in MARC. Um, and I worry about saying everything else. For instance, at Emory, um, I can only speak for my own mark records. We have certain fields that we use for internal information um, that I'm not entirely sure I want all of that data imported um, into archive space by default. We again, we're talking about default behavior, not that it couldn't be enhanced by local institutions. Um, but that's a good point. Any other thoughts? And maybe this is a time to jump in and yeah. say one of the tickets that we're going to um, that we're going to create in in relation to this is um, the importer um, isn't real descriptive uh, about what it actually has done, and we would like um, part of the report that comes out of the importer to explicitly state what it did. Um, so if it if it imported a you know a, a, a two forty five into a title field, you would get that output saying this went into this 245 went into the title field. And then that would allow uh, us to identify anything that was skipped. 
Uh, one of the things that's really insidious right now is that, that there's all kinds of fields that are just silently, um, nothing happens to them and they, they just go by or there are strange defaults like we'll talk about in a second with, um, uh, with extents. So, um, you know, kind of our, our meta ask to developers out of this discussion is going to be um, that we would actually like much more robust reporting around what's actually going on. So we can identify these things and then, you know, we don't support the 590, you, um, we would know that. Um, and you wouldn't kind of import a thousand records and then only notice um, afterward that the 590s are not getting in. And maybe just to add that this discussion really, this comes out of literally of three years of work since the Metadata Standards Committee uh, subcommittee was started. Uh, we've been wrestling with trying to maintain um, these import and export standards. And um, because the initial attempt was that archive space would support this kind of very large array of mark fields. Um, it, um, maintaining that uh, has been extremely difficult. And, and this is a, an approach that, that we think will work is to simplify, be very clear about um, what the core fields are that will be supported, support those robustly. And then anything else that falls out of that, uh, outside of that will have to be um, something that will be done, you know, custom, whether that's via API or plugin or something else. Um, and I think that's, probably going to be a good trade-off ultimately for the field because we will get, everybody will get good clean records out of the box that will have core elements. Um, and we won't have to continue to maintain kind of the edgiest of the edgy use cases. Yes, and there's a couple. Um, Joshua makes a, a good point that there may be some ways to provide for people who want all those noty notes um, in their records, a way to provide that mechanism. So thank you all for, for your comments. Um, and we will take those back and sort of think through those. Um, I will say as a parting thought before I turn it over to Kevin, that one of the things um, for members of the community not necessarily involved in maintaining these standards, one of the hard things um, is to keep on top of everything because everything seems to change. Everybody has their own flavor of life. And so really some of this is about simplifying the work so that the importers provide consistent <laughs> and we don't have all these tickets around why did it do this? Because we have these, um, it's a lot easier to maintain 50 mappings than 500. So. Um, Kevin, you want to talk about the very specific um, behavior tickets that we are looking into? Yes, I would love to. <laughs> um, let's see, let me share my screen first. All right. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for a, a great discussion so far. I think this is really hitting hitting a nerve here. And I think this just really validates what we've been struggling with um, on this group and working on in this group for the last um, for the last couple of years. Um, and it's interesting how all roads lead back to Mark. Uh, you know, EAD in, in some ways is easier because it, it is a, it's based on DAX um, and the archive space data model is based on DAX. So EAD is cleaner. Um, Mark comes out of this very long bibliographic tradition and um, there are multiple ways to do things despite it being a standard. Um, and it also is not really designed for archival description. So we just, we run into a lot more issues there. Um, so briefly, kind of where we are, um, where we are at. What I'm going to talk about here is one of the things that we encountered as we were trying to um, review the um, the, the importer uh, mappings is that the the way that Mark 300 data, so extent data, is imported um, by the um, by the AS Mark importer uh, is not very good right now. Uh, the basic, the default, uh, the, the, the behavior, the current behavior is um, it will take uh, whatever the value is in the subfield A, attempt to parse out the numbers uh, and the alpha, uh, the alpha content and split those things into um, um, the, the amount and the type. So one box. So if you have, if you literally have um, subfield A, one space box, the importer will be able to handle that and um, put that in into the field. Um, 300 sub F fields are ignored entirely. 
Um, despite our suspicion that actually the most common way that 300 fields are used by archivists is the sub A sub F construction, um, which is what we see here. I just see there's a typo. We should actually have a little sub A in front of that five there. It should, so it should be sub A five sub F boxes, sub A three sub F linear feet. Um, but before we cut a ticket saying this should be supported, um, we wanted to bring it to the community here and make sure um, that this is in fact the most commonly used um, uh, 300 construction. And if we were to propose a ticket that could handle this, um, that we were really capturing most people's use cases around 300 extent fields. Um, I also want to acknowledge here, so I we put out a call for feedback and the one piece of feedback we got um, was actually from Kate Bowers and was related to the one the one XX primary creator um, issue. And so it's very clear also from our previous discussion that is something that is that is of great concern to the community. It's something that I've encountered as well in, in our mark exports because our exports go from AS to um, into our catalog. And so I think that's something that um, this group will definitely take into account when thinking through what kind of tickets we want to support and prioritize, um, that that is an issue that, um, you know, probably not this term anymore, but um, in, into the next term, we will definitely be uh, looking at more closely. So thank you for that feedback. Um, so I'm going to stop talking just for a second, see, um, I'm going to look in the chat and see if anybody wants to make a comment in terms of what are the most common ways that you use 300 field when you're importing. And if anybody wants to um, unmute that, you can do that. And I'll take a look at the chat here. And alternatively, you're also welcome to go grab a 300. Um, if you have the, if you can quickly just go over to uh, whatever that would be and paste a few um, sample 300s in the chat, we would love those just as real life examples of 300s in the wild. Yeah, sample records are really, really, really useful. Um, and, uh, you know, the nature of these subgroups is we have our own records. I have my sample records that I know work for us, um, but to get a broader sample, I think would also address what we were talking about before in terms of being you know, relatively US centric and in the AS community, also very um, kind of academic community, um, large university libraries kind of centric. Uh, we'd also like to note that this is an FYI. If you have, if you did a large mark import in the past, say it was years ago and you've already forgotten about it, please note that if your pattern didn't perfectly conform to this, that you may have ended up with one linear feet and it would have wiped the archivist supplied extent. Um, certainly at an individual record, you may have noticed it, but at the aggregate level, what if you didn't? Um, this, this dropping of this information was silent. There would have been nothing to let you know that that had been replaced. So your archivist uh, supplied extent of very accurate in you know, 65 linear feet or record center cartons or however you did it would have just defaulted to one linear feet and it would have happened six years ago. Uh, so just an FYI about that, that that is uh, concerning for anyone doing bulk, bulk imports. Yeah, and this comes back to the point about reporting as well. This is really something where, um, honestly, I think those records should just fail. If you can't parse the extent, then that record should be failed and we need to go back and look at it. Um, but it's, it's kind of insidious to have this, uh, <laughs> this default data put in there. And um, you know, obviously you should be doing QC and that sort of thing, but um, I'm sure there are plenty of one linear feet um, records floating out there. Sarit? Hi, um, I'm just curious, are you looking to uh, bring this in as a string or per or when you talk about parsing, putting it into a field that then can be, you know, calculated on because you can do in the extent right you can do kind of have both you can put in a numerical value, and you can put in a, a, a string to bring in there and you can also ha you have that drop down field right to say a box or a linear foot or whatever you want to put in there so you really you got a couple of things going on there and you know you have choices I mean even the date field does this right you can put in the date in the field and that allows you to do things with it you know reporting and filtering and faceting and all this wonderful stuff that you do with databases um, because you that's what this is it's a database but yet you've got these label fields and stuff so I think that uh, you've got to take this into consideration here um, you know bring in this string but then <laughs> parse out the numbers <laughs> type of thing 
concept. Um, I don't know. It just uh, sometimes I, I, I think I, I know that I've uh, talk to some people that they forget you're dealing with a database and if you bring the data in as clean data you have opportunities in the future even even if it's not right away but even in the future you have opportunities to do more with that data um, so there's descript describing the content a certain way but there's um, manipulation of that yeah I think that's that's a real that's a really good point um, and given the kind of heterogeneous nature of, of the information that people keep in, in their 300s, <laughs> which is a repeatable field, by the way, <laughs> right? Um, it, it makes it very difficult to parse every possible use case. Um, but there's already some, you know, there's some logic in there. There's some regex in there. And, um, you know, kind of moving ahead to, to what I'm thinking is, I think we probably do want to support the sub A, sub F construction, whether it's one sub A and sub F or multiple sub A's and sub F's, um, and put in some logic and says, yes, take the number out of the sub A, and if there's no number, do this and do that. Um, or bring think, it into the value, right? You know, put in the number, bring in the sub as a value, because obviously it this string has value to, um, the institution, right? So you don't want to right. lose it. And perhaps they do want that in the value. It can always be edited later on if they want to change the value to something else, to whatever. Um, but at least the information is not lost and they can work within archive space to do whatever um, changes they that's wanted later on. But to lose it or to just literally fail and you've got thousands of records later on that you have to go back now and then what? Um, that's a PIA. <laughs> it is. Um, I, I will put in a plug for, as we're coming up to the end here of the discussion, but I will put in a plug for actually failing records, uh, maybe a little bit yeah. more, um, and just yeah. say, you know, if you need to do the data cleanup beforehand, um, th that to my mind is, is far preferable to um, kind of getting everything into AS and then trying to do the cleanup there. Um, but, you know, that caters to my tools and experience. So that's that's something that when we, you know, put in this ticket, um, we will certainly, um, you know, look for community feedback around that. Because um, there are a few different ways to do this, the kind of get it all in and deal with it later, or be much more strict and um, only support uh, very specific constructions that we know are fairly common, which is, again, the way I'm leaning, but um, we can see um, ultimately how that goes. Um, and I'm just looking at some great comments. Thank you. Thank you folks for putting in sample data on discussions of container summary and FizzDesk as fallbacks. Love it, love it, love it. Um, this is all stuff to, to consider here. So thanks for all that feedback. And this will definitely be an ongoing discussion, um, but it's obviously a place of great need. Thank you all so much. I could talk about this. This is obviously a much longer discussion. I want to assure you that we are going to save the chat and we will read the entire thing as a group. Um, I am very grateful for your time this morning. We all are. Um, once again, I'm going to post the, hey, we could really use you on, um, on metadata post in the chat. Please consider joining these committees and you will be able to make the change that you want to see in archive space. We would especially, especially love to hear um, voices using standards that are not the ones that we have been talking the most about today and the ones that are uh, that have a legacy of support in archive space. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, and especially, yeah, opinions about validate only, failing jobs, some of these more practical things that we can just do to make sure our data is not getting shoved into archive space in ways that are not appropriate is also, um, we appreciate your feedback on that as well. So thank you so much. And uh, Jessica, I, I will stop talking and I guess it's break time. And thank you to my co-presenters. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Elizabeth. Th thank you, Regina. Thank you, Jared in the world. And um, this has been uh, wonderful. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you so much, team. That was, that was a really, ex actually an exciting discussion about metadata at 9 a.m. That is hard to pull off. So thank you very much. Uh, we are going to go ahead and take a break now before we move into our next discussion. So um, we're going to give everyone 10 minutes to regroup and, and get their coffee and get settled in before our next discussion session. But we are saving this chat. This chat will get passed along to the metadata standards sub team and they will definitely be reviewing it. So if you if a thought comes to you while we're on break, drop it in the chat, it will get saved. Um, in the meantime, we're going to go ahead and, and take that break and uh, I will see everyone back here in eight minutes. Thanks, everyone.
All right, welcome back everyone. Uh, we're gonna move on to our next discussion. Our next discussion will be led by members of the Archives Bay